Chief Justice, may it please the court. I'm Giancarlo Conoparo. I'm Zach Smith. And welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. Welcome back to another episode of SCOTUS 101. How are you, Zach? I'm doing okay, GC. How are you? Doing well. So give us the rundown of the Supreme Court this week. Well, it's been a relatively quiet week for the court with no new grants or opinions and only two oral arguments. Of course, you may have seen uh, the justices had another engagement on Wednesday with uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor administering the vice presidential oath of office and the chief justice administering the presidential oath of office. GC, what was going on with oral arguments this week? Well, we had two. We had uh, the first up was uh, the Federal Communications Commission versus Prometheus Radio Project. The issue in this case is whether the Federal Communications Commission, I'm going to call it the FCC, lawfully relaxed a rule called the Cross Ownership Rule, which bars the same entity from owning both a newspaper and either a radio or TV station in the same market. Now, the case is pretty technical, but it has serious implications for how Americans consume media. The cross-ownership rule is one of many very old FCC rules that were aimed at limiting monopolization of local media markets. And uh, to do that, they forbid any one person or company from buying up a bunch of local media outlets. In 2017, the FCC relaxed some of these old rules, explaining that they were no longer relevant in a media market dominated by the internet, nationwide newspapers, and TV outlets. In short, Old-fashioned local media, especially local newspapers, were dying, so the FCC concluded that it no longer made sense to prevent someone from buying multiple outlets in one location because that stopped them from trying to turn a profit with economies of scale. On the other side, you have a nonprofit group arguing that these old rules preserve diversity of ownership, which is in and of itself a public good that the FCC must protect. The Third Circuit sided with the challengers, blocking the FCC and holding that the FCC failed to adequately consider how its proposed changes would affect media owned by women and minorities. The FCC argued that nothing in the relevant statutes required it to consider that factor, but that regardless, it had considered it. It had data that suggested that its proposed rule change would have no negative impact on women and minorities who owned media outlets. At oral arguments, the justices seemed rather inclined to side with the FCC. Many of them seemed to agree that the FCC had, in fact, considered the impact of its proposed changes and that this issue amounted to essentially a matter of policy that the courts shouldn't second guess. Seems like an interesting case. The court also heard arguments in BP PLC v. Mayor and City of Baltimore this week. In this case, the City of Baltimore sued several oil and gas companies in Maryland State Court, alleging that the activities of those companies had contributed to global warming and had harmed the city. The company sought to remove the case to federal court, but the federal district court remanded the case or sent it back to state court and the companies appealed. Now, typically, a district court's remand decision is not appealable, but there are two narrow exceptions. The question before the court was whether a federal appellate court can review any issue in a district court's remand order or whether it can only review if one of the two exceptions applied. The Fourth Circuit in this case took the latter view. This case presented tough textual questions and the justices seemed divided during the argument, but its outcome could have important implications for other climate change lawsuits that are currently pending in state courts around the country. Justice Samuel Alito was recused from this case and didn't participate. Well, that's it from the Supreme Court this week. No opinions. But we have an interview for you. This week, we're joined by Fifth Circuit Judge Jennifer Walker Elrod. I could start this introduction by telling you all about her impressive credentials and record on the bench. But I think Judge Elrod would want me to tell you, first and foremost, that she is and will forever be a devoted Baylor Bear. The rest, I'll leave up to her. (laughs) Judge, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here with you today. So my first question for you, of course, is your Hamilton song. (laughs) You and a number of other judges, uh, notably Judge Eskridge, made a music video singing an adaptation of You'll Be Back from Hamilton. What is the story behind how that happened? Well, Judge Eskridge is always getting me into these kinds of things. I had no idea that it would go viral, though. 
um, seriously, this was just a, a appreciation for the bench and bar in the Southern District of Texas. Judge Eskridge and I had done an, another version of this for our in a court group welcoming people for the year. He and I do a number of programs along with a couple of other of our, our, our friends and colleagues uh, for our inner court group. We, um, we put on musical productions every year, uh, including one on Magna Carta and one on the amenders, which featured the slaughterhouse cases and had legal superheroes. So we, he, he's a great parody songwriter and we have a lot of fun with law and music. We need some levity in this world. <laughs> So rumor has it, this is not your first experience with parody. Can you speak to the rumors that while at Harvard Law, you participated in that school's famous parody show? Well, I can neither confirm nor deny those rumors. <laughs> I, um, if I were going to confirm them, I might um, mention that I was very active in Harvard Law School Drama Society, and I think I did six or seven shows while I was there. We, didn't, we did more than just the parody um, you might want to watch There's No Place Like Holmes. Um, and Glinda, the good legal recruiter, rings a bell. So, <laughs> Are these on YouTube? I have no idea. I, you know, I, I'm old. So these, these may be pre, not never been put on YouTube. I'm not sure. I've never looked. Well, uh, you can be sure that I'll be doing that after this interview. <laughs> so, Judge, turning to more serious matters, you did your undergrad at Baylor. Uh, and you're still you're you're well known for your love of Baylor. Are you still involved with the school at all? Well, Sikkim Bears. I'm I'm delighted that my Baylor Baylor classmate Donnie Willett has joined us on the Fifth Circuit uh, in the, recently, and so that's been a good thing. I am very much involved with Baylor. Uh, I serve on the Board of Regents there, and I'm the Chair of Academic Affairs. And of course, this has been a very busy year trying to figure out how to do, uh, and I, of course, I haven't been involved in the day-to-day, -day, our wonderful administration has, but how to handle COVID and, and the classes and make sure that our students get a quality education and high academics and that the professors have the tools necessary to teach virtually. So it's been a, on some of the, in some of the classes. So it's been a very um, demanding year, but uh, I, I do love Baylor. I met my husband there. In fact, we met in, a, in an undergraduate course that's required on constitutional law in the Constitution. I think every university should have an undergraduate course to te teach its students about the importance of the Constitution and its structures. What made you decide to go to law school after Baylor? Was it that con law class? No, I think I had wanted to be a lawyer for a long time. When I was in elementary school, my grandmother took me with her to jury duty. She told me that she thought that I might should be a lawyer. We, we had no lawyers in our family whatsoever, but she said I was good at finding loopholes to get out of my parents' discipline so that perhaps I should consider being a lawyer and that I did like to argue. Um, I wrote a paper in the fourth grade that I wanted to be the first female justice. Uh, and I remember at parents' night, it was on the wall, and I, people were laughing at it. So, And I couldn't understand why they were laughing. Thankfully, we didn't have to wait long before Sandra Day O'Connor became the first female justice. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, I'm grateful for the, for the path that justices have paved um, and including the wonderful chiefs that we've had on my court. After law school, you clerked for two years for Judge Sim Lake. What was that like? It was a great experience. It's, it's my favorite experience. I would always say to people, this was my favorite job ever. Um, people, but I said that recently and someone asked me, did I include the current job? And I have to say, uh, it's perhaps a draw now because I do <laughs> love what I do. I'm very thankful to be on the court. Uh, Judge Lake was a fabulous mentor to me and I still see him in our building and from time to time. And it's, 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 it's always a pleasure. He had a, um, he ran a great, a very disciplined courtroom. He was respectful of everyone, but he, but he kept things moving. And I, and I really learned a lot 
from him. And that way, whenever I became a trial judge later, I was able to, you know, sometimes I would have a jury in the box and then a jury deliberating. I would always keep the jury trials going. I think that the more you can be in trial and keeping the cases moving, uh, the better it is for the parties and the lawyers. Do you have any especially notable memories from your clerkship? There were so many interesting trials. We had a surprise party for him once uh, where he thought he was coming into the courtroom with a bunch of difficult litigants. And uh, we knocked him in and there was a courtroom full of people to celebrate his, <laughs> his, his one of his occasions. And uh, it was very funny because he would have these hearings on Friday afternoons for difficult litigants. And he thought this was one of those hearings. But <laughs> I, I just learned so much from him. He's, he's, a, he's a great judge. Over the course of your career, who have some of your other mentors been? Well, um, I have had mentors uh, at the law firm, I, 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 Stephen Tibbs and Rufus Oliver, some other, some other very fine lawyers that I practiced with, and some judges that I worked with in the, in the Harris County District Courts. Jane Bland, who's now on the, the Supreme Court in Texas and others. And so and so I've had a number of really great colleagues through the years and and mentors. And, and certainly on this court, I have had fabulous mentors as well. You know, diverse, interesting mentors, of, you know, Judge Jones and um, Judge Higginbotham and so many people have um, have helped me become a better judge. What was it like being a first a state court trial judge? Oh, it was a lot of fun. I loved trying cases. Um, I was very fortunate that I was in a big, you know, in Harris County, Texas, one of the fourth largest city in America, uh, county in America. And I was able to try over 200 jury and non-jury trials while I was there in the five and a half years. Um, and it's, I love, I love trying cases. It's, 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 it's interesting. You get to learn about lots of different businesses, um, and, and people's lives and, and it's, and it's, and it's important. And I have great respect for the jury. Uh, I both, uh, you know, from my experience with jurors, I think that jurors almost always get it right. They don't always get it right. And it's good. We have courts of appeals. But they almost always get it right. And so I have great respect for the jury and our founders' um, beliefs in the jury system. And so it's, it's, it was a great uh, privilege and fun to be part of that. I remember trying one case that involved was from the, um, was about the sinking of this large vessel called the DLB 269. And we had a series of cases on it. And this was based upon a hurricane, Hurricane Roxanne, and there's a documentary about it on the Weather Channel. And it was just fascinating to see all the moving parts in that case and try to figure out a way to streamline and preside over it in a way that would make sense so we could get, you know, get to some results for the litigants. Would, would you say that was your favorite case or your most interesting well, it's hard to say. I don't think you should have favorite cases, really. Uh, it's like favorite law clerks or favorite children. You can appreciate uh, things about a lot of them. And so it was very memorable and it was really challenging. Um, and I think it made me a better judge uh, then and now. Starting with your confirmation process to the Fifth Circuit, what was it like going from the state to the federal bench? Well, you know, it's different. I used to run for office and now I don't. I, you know, I would say that from the judge's perspective, I've run for office with an opponent. I've run for office with no opponent and I've been appointed for life for good behavior. And the latter is best from my perspective. <laughs> but so, so, you know, just the process is so different, you know, running for office in an extremely large county in America was was very challenging. And it was a, a vote of confidence for me when no one chose to run against me when I was up for re-election, which I know doesn't happen now very often because they thought I was doing a reasonably good job. And so that meant that was that was a vote of confidence. You know, the job is the, a different job because it's one was trial and this is appellate. 
the nomination process, uh, you know, being nominated is very different than running for office. There's not, especially for an appellate bench, there wasn't a committee heading it up. H- how does someone notice you and ask you to do it? Is this is really um, it was kind of like lightning striking. Someone came up to me and asked me if I'd ever thought about being on the Fifth Circuit, and um, and as you know, I I love music. And I said, yeah, and I've thought about being on American Idol, too. Uh, So it seemed about as far-fetched as that um, at the time. But then, lo and behold, I got a call, and I was asked to visit uh, with the White House Counsel's Office. And I um, was on the verge of being the nominee, but I had had some personal bad news um, that I had been diagnosed uh, with breast cancer. Mm. And so... They called me to say that they thought that I was the nominee, and I said, oh, and I didn't, you know, I'm not sure I was still in the running, uh, because, you know, there's a long gap usually between whenever you you first interview, and or maybe there's not for some people, but for me, there was a gap, and I said, and I need to disclose this to you, um, but I was very pleased um, that they said they wanted to still move ahead with me, and I'm very, also very thankful that my health is perfectly fine. And, uh, that was a, just a, just a blip in my life. And so I'm, I'm very grateful right. for that. Uh, but so that was an, it really, you know, an interesting and difficult time. The confirmation itself was not, um, as involved as some others, you know, even some others that were being confirmed at the same time. Uh, there were some that had been delayed in my circuit and I was able to move along at a, a pretty, decent pace, although to me it seemed glacial, but compared to others, I was blessed in that way. I, I think Judge, Judge Southwick talks about in his book that I was able to leapfrog a little bit. Um, and it wasn't to do with me, it was just to do with the situation. And so I was very thankful and I was confirmed um, uh, with a voice vote. And I was you know, I think they said I was not controversial and they wanted to put some people through. So I was, I was very thankful for that process. I'm sure. And and I've been here 13 years now. So having uh, been there for 13 years, how would you reflect on the day-to-day life of a a federal appellate judge versus the day-to-day life of a trial judge? Well, it's funny that you say that. Um, I would say, you know, I, I think I'm probably supposed to say it's very different but I talked to one of my former law clerks earlier this week, and he's a lawyer, a trial lawyer at a big firm. And he said, Judge, you really taught us what it is, how to manage cases like a trial lawyer. So I didn't realize I'm still managing cases like a trial lawyer. Um, so I'm not sure it's as different as it's supposed to be. I, I did think it would be a very... Um, cerebral job, that we would be a slower pace where we would have time to think deep thoughts. And I do hope that we think deep thoughts, but we have to think deep thoughts fairly quickly on this court because we have such a high volume of cases. You know, we run neck and neck with the 11th Circuit, and I think right now we have the highest number of cases per judge of any court in the country. So we're moving at a pretty good clip all the time. And in that way, it's similar to a busy trial bench. But of course, you know, what you're doing in the case management is different. And, um, I, you know, I have to spend a lot of time just writing and I need uh, blocks of time for that. And so it is different in that way. My law clerks are very helpful to keep, you know, my really large book of cases, help me manage them to make sure nothing falls through the cracks. I And I love my law clerks. I would say that, you know, getting to do this job and to serve our country in this way, taking an oath to serve and to to rule, you know, to follow the rule of law in each and every case is my duty. And I'm so grateful to do it. But getting to work with the next generation of lawyers every day uh, and mentor them and learn from them is, is one of the greatest joys of my life. And so I'm very close to my former law clerks and my current law clerks, and I'm looking forward to the next round, you know, group. And it's, it's, it's a great job. And it's, uh, and law clerks really contribute to that. 
Do you have any special things or traditions you do with them? You know, we do um, do some things. Every year we go to the Houston Livestock and Show and Rodeo, which is a, you know, is a pretty big deal around here. Uh, we have fun with that. We, uh, many of my law clerks participate in our inner court group and they, so they'll be in a musical. Uh, they don't, they're not required, of course, to do that, but some of them choose to do that. We just finished our show for this year, which was about the Mayflower Compact, the 400 years of it, but it was Plymouth Rocks. And so some of them were in the Plymouth Rock show. Um, and at the, on their last day, I will do a parody song for them and they will often do a parody song for me. So we have a, we have a lot of fun and we, you know, of course we enjoy our times together in new Orleans, although this year's clerks have not yet had that experience because of COVID. In your chambers, do you keep any special mementos from your career or, or uh, from anything else? You know, there's a lot going on in my chambers. Uh, I would never win one of those awards or be picked to be on one of those television shows about minimalism. <laughs> I, you know, I of course have like many other judges. I have a very large collection of bobbleheads, courtesy of um, Green Bag and, and Texas Review of Law and Politics, and also the others that I've received through the years. I have a flag that's over my desk that flew on my courthouse on my last day that my colleagues gave me from state court. I have a, an official Luke Skywalker lightsaber and a, a replica Starship Enterprise uh, and a bunch of Lord of the Rings figurines. So I'm pretty much a nerd. I, I think that would be fair to say. But I also have some, um, I'm, I'm very much into, uh, I, I love the Bible. And in fact, I've taught Bible study for many, many, many years. And uh, I have a page from a Bible from the 1500s that I was presented after I gave uh, a talk, a lunchtime talk once about uh, from Second Chronicles about Jehoshaphat, of all things. And, and, and I have this, this page from this Bible from the 1500s, and I really like that. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's an eclectic place around here. <laughs> uh, Judge, if you were to give uh, any advice to to young lawyers, what would it be? I would say that, you know, if I were going to give my law clerks advice, I would give them, you know, motherly advice. Finish things on time. Keep your work organized. Proofread your work with a ruler to make sure it's printed out. And, and I know this is bad for the tree lovers. Uh, but I would say print it out and proofread it with a ruler to try to look for typographical errors and other kinds of errors. And, you know, these, this kind of practical, sturdy advice. Don't promise more than you can deliver. Uh, don't take on too many things at once. Uh, you know, all of those kind of good, practical, sturdy advice. I would say that if I were going to give some philosophical advice, I would say, especially to law clerks, that I hope that when they leave here, they understand why it's important that our judiciary is limited. I don't want them to be impressed with the power that they see. I, I want them to understand why we should be the least dangerous branch and uh, really get, get, a, get the feel for our, the limited role of the judiciary in, um, in our country. And I hope that they come away with that, that understanding about that in our separation of powers. Judge, one final question before you go. If you could have a conversation with any Supreme Court justice, living or dead, who would it be and what would you talk about? Well, you know, I've been very blessed that I've had conversations over the years with Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, and I've been you know, in other justices, I've been very blessed. But so I think I would have to go back to back in time. And I think I would pick uh, Justice Robert Jackson. I would like to ask him about Youngstown Steel. And if he knew that when he was writing his three part test about executive power, did he realize that it was going to become something that would be used all the time? 
uh, in discussing these important issues about the separation of powers, you know, or was he frustrated that it was just a concurrence at the time? Did he not even realize it? You know, I would like to talk to him about his Korematsu descent. I would like to talk to him about what it was like to be a justice when you didn't graduate from law school or what it would be like to have uh, Justice Rehnquist as your law clerk, you know, um, and the Nuremberg trials, uh, the, the work, his work there. There's so much to talk to him. And I would probably selfishly want to get some writing tips from him. <laughs> Such a masterful writer. And I'm always trying to improve my writing. I don't believe that I am one of the best writers. I, I think I'm very mechanical and I'm always working on improving my writing. So I think I could learn from him. Well, Judge, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It was a great pleasure and honor to be here. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too, Judge. GC, are you ready for some inauguration theme trivia this week? How did I know, Zach, that you might be <laughs> picking inauguration theme trivia? Well, you know, the justices uh, have uh, attended inauguration and they have historically played a role in uh, presidential inaugurations. So I thought, what better time uh, than this week to, to talk inauguration? You know, if I was smart, I might have done some research in advance. Listen, I have no doubt you'll uh, you'll still put me to shame at uh, trivia. <laughs> so, all right, here's the first one. As we saw this past Wednesday, the chief justice typically administers the oath of office to the incoming president. So here's my question for you, GC. Who was the first president to be sworn in by a sitting chief justice? Well, it couldn't have been Georgie Boy because he didn't have a chief justice. So I'm going to go with John Adams. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It was John Adams. And in fact, in 1789, when George Washington was first sworn into office, he was sworn in by Robert Livingston, who was a New York state judge at the time. And when he was sworn in for a second time in 1793, he was sworn in by Associate Justice William Cushing. I forgot about the second term. He could have been sworn in by the chief his second term. Silly me. Well, I got it right by luck, I guess. Hey, it's uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Uh, <laughs> but here, let me ask you this, GC. I'll give you bonus points if you can name the chief justice who swore John Adams in. Oh, okay. It couldn't have been John Jay because he left early. That's right. It couldn't have been his replacement because he was, I forget, was that Rutledge? who was the recess appointment who didn't get uh, confirmed. I'm impressed. That's right. Who came after Rutledge? I feel like there's a gap I'm missing, but I'm going to say Marshall. Ooh, close, close. Oliver Ellsworth is the correct answer. Uh -huh. And your reasoning was was spot on. Ellsworth was our third chief justice uh, after John Jay and John Rutledge, and he was the immediate predecessor uh, to the legendary John Marshall. Uh, so you were, you were close, GC. All right. So let's shift away from the chief justice now and ask, GC, do you know who the most recent president was to be sworn in by someone other than the chief justice? Uh, yes, that would have been LBJ, and he had to be sworn in uh, on site, basically, after the assassination. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, another interesting fact about LBJ's swearing into office, it was the first and only time that the presidential oath of office has been administered by a woman. District Judge Sarah T. Hughes, who sat on the Northern District of Texas at the time, administered the oath to Johnson aboard Air Force One. And of course, you know, the moment was captured in uh, what some have described as the most famous photo ever taken aboard Air Force One. So let me ask you this. There's one other president who has been sworn in by a United States District Court judge. Do you know who that is? Oh, I don't. Well, that's okay. It was Teddy Roosevelt, who unfortunately also had to be sworn in because his predecessor, William McKinley, was assassinated while he was visiting Buffalo, New York. Yeah, uh, so I had you, a, I, I, because of the LBJ connection, I thought maybe it, it must have been somebody else who had come to the presidency after an assassination, but I couldn't think of that off the top of my head. 
Well, that's all right. You did excellent trivia today. And, you know, in fact, uh, the the district judge who swore in Teddy uh, was U.S. District Judge John Hazel of the Western District of New York. So Judge Hazel and Judge Hughes, they're the only two district court judges to have administered the presidential oath of office. Uh, pretty Very interesting. Uh, yeah, pretty good distinction. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much to everyone for listening to SCOTUS 101. Please be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you listen. And as always, we'd appreciate if you left us a five-star rating. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at SCOTUS101 and email us at SCOTUS101 at heritage.org with your questions, comments, or ideas for future shows. You've been listening to SCOTUS 101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Giancarlo Canaparo and Zach Smith. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and John Pop. For more information, visit heritage.org.